In September of 1960, a boy was born on a small island nation, disadvantaged, facing poverty, and surrounded by uncertainty. Through his life, we witness how the favor of God will move a life of obscurity to one of notoriety, prominence, and international influence, all for His glory, presenting the life and legacy of His grace, Bishop Neil Clarence Ellis. Hello, I'm Jerome Sawyer. And I'm Candia Dames, and it is our pleasure to present the story of a prolific Bahamian who stands as an example of the Bahamian dream coming alive. His has been a life of sacrifice and commitment to excellence in the things of God, which has worked towards setting him aside as an outstanding voice in the Bahamas and to the nations of the world. Your plans from God are custom designed by God. There are some things you just have to deal with. There are some things you just have to go through. God ordained the family. If it's in season, you've got to understand. When we consider the life and ministry of His Grace, Bishop Neil C. Ellis, we cannot help but to marvel at his great accomplishments. How did a seemingly ordinary boy from a small island nation and one of the smallest islands within that nation born to ordinary parents of nine children with no notable social or financial status could rise from his disadvantaged childhood to become a renowned leader and a minister of the gospel, not only in his country, but to a wide spectrum of leaders, religious ministers, and others around the world. Neil was born saved. He was the only one of all of Clarence and Elba children who used to cry to go to church. <laughs> well, you know, Neil was like a little, he was like a little nerd, you know, um, he, he, wore those, he, he wore those big glasses, um, he was always in the church, uh, his Bible was bigger than, than he was, you know, and um, everybody seemed to, 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 to take to his spirit because he was very, he was very likable. Um, he was one who would never really um, hesitate to tell you how he felt. And uh, so, you know, all of that led to uh, where he is today. On Sundays, after, after the morning service, Delton, myself, and Neil, Daddy will tell us after we done eat dinner, go and catch a nap, for you not go into church tonight. And of course, me and Delton didn't want to go. <laughs> so we make nice playthrough. And then Daddy told us, well, we're not going to church tonight. And Neil is the only fellow I see crying. He was always a child wanted to know the difference between the two of anything. Why? What? Why are you going to do that? You know, these was the questions many times that he would ask. And my dad used to like for him to follow him, and he used to like to be close to him. This documentary walks us through the life of obedience and service, revealing the relationship of God and his servant chosen to walk by faith by laying comforts and ambition aside to do what has never been done, as seen by example throughout Scripture. To understand this divine call to purpose, we look to where it all began. 
Porgy Bay Bimini, the Bahamas, a small island off the coast of Florida, approximately 16 square miles, with fewer than 1,000 residents, Bishop Ellis's birthplace and where he spent his formative years. Here was born a boy many would describe as different, a boy whose character and gifting set him apart from other children. Growing up in the home when it was time for church, he would always be the first one ready and willing to go. In church, seven o'clock, six, five thirty, he's ready. He and he's headed out the door. And like like I was saying, when when, when he leave home, he have the biggest Bible that he could find. And he walks with that under his arm. And you know, we would look out to see where he's going so early. And the first place he would stop, like Ken say, is at Mr. Saul and Miss Grady House. And he would go in there. When he come to my house, I said, why you stop just Mr. Saul and Miss Grady? He said, well, I have to pray for them. He said, before I go to church, I have to stop and say a word of prayer for them. We had a, a young uh, man in our church named Solomon McDonald. He had a store, and during the time of him going to service, he had to pass his little store that Solomon had with this Bible. It was so much until he challenged him. He said, What you doing with that Bible? He said, That Bible be in you. He said, but you would never leave unless you have that Bible. He said, I bet you you don't even know anything in that Bible. He said, and then I'm gonna challenge you. And he challenged him. He opened the Bible and he uh, suggests a portion of scripture to read. And he just opened the Bible and started reading. He said, you ain't got to close, you ain't got to read it all. Don't hold it. He said, you're capable in handling that Bible. God bless you. From an early age, it was apparent that God had a special call for young Ellis' life. This was manifested through a series of events so precisely aligned that it could have only been the will of God. During the month of May 1972, on the grounds of the Bimini All Age School, later named the Louise McDonald High School, a well spoken 11 year old student introduced then Prime Minister, the late Sir Lyndon Oscar Pinley. He got up and he addressed the audience and welcomed the Prime Minister. No people or anything like that. And he just went and welcomed him to the people that night, which was shock to him, as well as joy to know and to see and to witness at the end of the service that they had. He got up and he said, uh, I don't know the chap. He said, but he knows me. He said, and uh, to see him welcome me up here, right from a challenge, not knowing, not reading, but just from memories. He said, this school can't hold him. His presentation and presence impressed Lyndon so much that he offered the young boy a scholarship to attend school at the private Anglican school, St. John's College. As destiny would have it, Neil Ellis was relocated from his home in Porgy Bay Bimini to the capital city of Nassau. This one date with destiny changed the course of his life and set him on the path from obscurity to national and international prominence. The Bimini to Nassau sojourn was also experienced by a number of other Bimini youths who accepted Neil as a leader, despite being one of the youngest of those who were relocated. 
where we stayed in Monday Light, he, um, uh, the lady went to St. John's on Meeting Street. So he got involved. She told us that she wanted us to join the youth choir. Well, she didn't push it, so we didn't go. But Bishop went. He went to practice um, during the week, and then he sang in the choir Sunday morning, and then he teached Sunday school. So he didn't he didn't lose lose focus of, of, of church. And and in, and during the time in Monte Light, he was always singing. He he's doing chores and he's singing. Uh, he's doing homework and he's singing. He couldn't understand what he was singing, but personally I know he was always singing. So this church was always in him, and he never, you know, he never, never let it go. In childhood, young Ellis would learn the hard lessons of vulnerability and humility. Many individuals would have considered such hardship a cause to turn away from God and the church that had nurtured them. But young Ellis chose to shine in dark periods of his life. I'll never forget Neil, uh, how Neil connected with the Wilsons was Neil used to have to go outside. He, he lived in Mount El Heights uh, with some family member. Um, but you dare not burn the power in the house to talk with study all night. So he had to take a, a milk crate and sit outside under the lamppost. And so he would stay up all night out there. He excelled so much so that he attracted the attention and kind affection of his first form homeroom teacher, Mrs. Sharon Wilson. Again, this connection would prove to be a divine alignment for the fulfillment of his kingdom assignment, as Mrs. Wilson and her husband, Mr. Franklin Wilson, became both his foster parents and mentors. This was a time of preparation. I can still recall going into Form 1M and just the way a lot of the students were seated in that class. And I remember that Neil was seated towards the back, to the left, the row before the end. And if I'm not mistaken, the desk before the back, over in that left corner. So as nondescript a seat as you can have in a classroom was the one that he would have had. And, um, but you know what? He just didn't need any aids because by force of personality, you knew that he was there. And so my encounter with him then was as that young student from Bimini in Form 1M as his English teacher. You know, he, he, he toyed with track, he went on the field, he did everything. I remember he was in Burton House. He'll score a few points for Burton House and, you know, but whenever there was, he was a team player all through school. And, but he really made his mark distinction as a debater. And that was because of his just capacity to research, he would research, and then he would combine that knowledge that he had with wit. If there's a theme to come from it is, um, Neil, what you see is what you get. So the fact is what she was seeing in the classroom and with his peers and all the rest of it, once a certain comfort level developed, I was seeing tracking the same thing. And then that same sense of uh, oratory and debating and so on and so forth. Well, it so happens by circumstance, I used to debate for St. John's and, and I had more than a casual interest in debating. And so um, when he was preparing and all the rest of it, 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 it was sort of like my wife would do so much and and then I would sort of like play certain roles. And it's just wonderful, that's, that's the bottom line. I must say in Franklin's time, he was certainly the number one debater for St. John's. In my time, I say I went undefeated for St. John's and Neil came behind and he went undefeated for St. John's. And so, you know, we had, we, we were excited 
whenever he was in a debate. And so, you know, it, it wasn't just casual encouragement, you know, you, you know, you had to keep the side up. During this time of preparation, the now teen Ellis continued to display leadership among his peers at school and in the church. He also began to distinguish himself as a pioneer of firsts, having petitioned for his high school to have its first graduation ceremony and to include school rings as a part of the graduating experience. But something about Neil that was extremely different. One of the first things I noticed with him is I, I saw him from the outside because I didn't really know him that well, was that his clothes was, was extremely tight. And like he was wearing a bunch of handy dolls. And one of the first things I noticed that he would, he would wear a short uh, sleeve sh uh, um, shirt. All his shirts were kind of tied up like this. I remember them being tied up on his, on his shoulder. He had a, a, a paper towel behind his neck, must be to cool him down from the sweat. And he had a little bit of powder on his chest. And what is interesting about that is his clothes were well pressed, but his pants was gunning, but it was also, it was, the hem was out, but yet it was still gunning and it was almost like it was pressed uh, uh, east to west as opposed to north to south. So that was the first thing that I noticed. I said, this guy, this, this, must be, this guy must be an orphan or something. Uh, and, and, uh, but I noticed that changed very, very quickly when I got to know him, because that was the outside. But when I got to really meet him and, and found that he was witty, he was wise, and he was extremely well-spoken, and then that scripture that I mentioned, I called you. I saw something unique and special about him from even then in high school when all of us were very unassuming. We didn't know who we are, we were, but it was always something unique about Neil. He was, he was the a part of the, the the life of the party. He was always loud. He was well spoken. He was jovial. He was easily to get to know, and he was a nice person to just talk to. Got to know him right away because he was always a very, very vivacious personality, very outgoing. And I think from day one, we all knew that Neil had a calling, um, a calling to be a, a, a warrior for God. From the very, very first time you met him, you knew that because he just emanated um, the kind of personality that would be someone who would be there to advocate for um, not only uh, people in general, but also to advocate the Word of God. He knew that right away. He never ever wavered from that So through the whole time that I knew him at St. John's College. So that was straight up to when we graduated in the fifth form. Even though we knew that he had a calling um, for God, um, he was still a very, very um, outgoing personality. And so he participated in all of the programs that the school had. Um, we had um, certainly, um, <clears throat> I think one of the most memorable occasions or times in our lives was, um, I, I remember in, in Form 2, Mrs. Sharon Wilson, who really became his second mother, uh, who was married to you know, Mr. Franklin Wilson. She was our teacher. <clears throat> and I recall that, uh, you know, she was teaching us English literature. And so, of course, um, she made sure that we, you know, put on plays and recited the po poetry from Shakespeare and that kind of thing. And Neil always was part of the group that really, really would have participated in those things. And so to that end, I think, you know, she he's always been someone in our class who everybody would have loved and respected. So you have this debating star in St. John's, very charismatic person, um, well respected by his peers. By then they all call him Rev. He was always a really constructive young man. And, you know, I think it was Shakespeare who says a favorite has no friends. And so, he would have been easily singled out. And so by the time he got to fifth form, for some reason, the authority and the administration of the school <coughs> in the selection of prefects, head boy, head girl, that would have been some, let's say 15 students collectively out of 
may be 60. And lo and behold, Neil Ellis was not a part of that. And I think everybody was a bit taken aback. But what was absolutely amazing was the reaction from the student body. They felt the, the injustice and they acted on it. They came together, th including the leadership that was selected. In fact, led by the leadership that was selected. They came together and decided how they ought to address the injustice that they saw in Neil Ellis not being a part of the leadership group. And so they decided that they would, for the very first time in St. John's College, form a student council. And lo and behold, who is going to be the president of that student council? That is now for the leadership, students who've been selected as leadership to select the president of their council, their student council. And that body got together and surprised the administration by selecting somebody outside of themselves to be their leader. That's how the students addressed what they saw as the injustice. And so when it was time to really put, you know, bring the message forward and speak to those who were in, in authority about issues which I think affected all of the students, Neil was certainly one of those people who came forward and was quite happy to assist and to do it. And so um, he became one of those people who I think the class looked up to and um, respected to a large extent. And I don't think that that has ever changed. Right now, we are very much together, you know, in the class. We, we almost, on a daily basis, we have a, a group, a social media group, and we correspond with each other. And Neil is always a part of the correspondence. Despite his busy life, and the fact that he um, has, you know, this Global United Fellowship, which is a, such a huge organization, not only locally, and in, but it's also internationally a huge organization. He's never too busy to post something in the group. And it's always something that is uplifting to the persons in the group or uplifting in general. And of course, it had to be ratified by the staff. And I was on the staff then, so I could say, without fear of contradiction, that to the every number, everybody, every staff member voted in favor of Neil Ellis as the first president of the Student Council for St. John's College. Bishop Ellis back then was uh, very astute and he always stood out as a leader. What I remember most about him was the fact that he always had a clear mission for what he wanted to accomplish. And he exhibited those signs very early in his life. Uh, in Cobus, he was a hands-on leader uh, was tough and uh, very rigid, but fair. And so he was able to pull off what I believe was the very first um, College of Bahamas Union of Students uh, Youth Leaders Conference, which brought together high school leaders from uh, the various high schools throughout New Providence and the Family Islands, and, and as well uh, leaders from the College of the Bahamas. And that was one of his uh, major accomplishments early in the game. We used to have an abandoned room as the office for uh, the union and as well for, for you know, extracurricular activities, playing uh, ping pong and all that. But Bishop petitioned uh, the powers that be uh, for us to eventually evolve to have uh, full offices for the College of Bahamas Union of Students and uh, indoor dining. So all of those folks who are now uh, passed through the College of Bahamas since uh, our days in Cobus uh, can thank the Bishop for his efforts in those regards. He was president of Cobus and he requested the incoming students, any of the incoming students that were past presidents of their student council, he requested um, a meeting with all of us. 
that's how our friendship actually began. That's how we met. Um, because I was the past president of the student council at St. Augustine's. And so going from SAC to COB, when he requested that meeting, I attended. Um, and that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. We had, we had lunch every day. It would usually be himself, um, along with another friend of ours, Laura Pratt, who's Laura Pratt Charlton. And um, we usually met for lunch every day, either at the then McDonald's, which was very new, or under the big fig tree. But the key to this was Laura or myself were the ones who would always pay for lunch. Never knew. <laughs> we always treated him, even if I brought lunch and he and I would sit under the big fig tree. It was still that I would always make sure that there was adequate for him. I'd always make sure that that was the case. It was, it was just an unspoken kind of understanding. Bishop was was a, an is a talented man of God, and he had various avenues available to him. In the first instance, he was studying to become an accountant, so he could have ended up becoming um, a, a successful CPA. Uh, he had. Uh, interest in national affairs, and he could have very well be end up being a politician like I did, uh, but he didn't choose to go that route. We always knew that Neil had a calling on his life because from even before he was ordained, we used to call him Rev. He hung out with those of us who were above his age and who were then in ministry as pastors, but he, he hung with us and he was a part of that movement. So he knew the inner working of Baptist from he was a young, a really young man. So when he started pastoring, he really has been pastoring not officially for quite a time. I can recall Bishop Ellis moving about with the late superintendent of the Bahamas Baptist Union, uh, the Reverend Dr. C.W. Saunders, of course, a uh, national religious icon. And so, and so that level of connection, and of course that would be my recollection, you could tell and get an understanding that there was greatness on his life, you know, and, and he walked with a level of impact and uh, never thought small. Of course, people may not know it, but he's a very skilled musician, uh, a skilled pianist at the time. There weren't so much the keyboard thing then. Uh, so very, very skilled pianist, a choirster, and had the ability, when he took the choir over, the choir grew in masses. They traveled uh, internationally. Uh, they were uniformed, well coordinated. And of course, this was in his very, very earliest days of ministry. My sister and I were a part of that choir. And um, every Thursday and Tuesday, we have choir practice. I always was late going to choir practice, so me and him always had an argument as soon as I reached, because he, he was always a man stipula for time, and he was always a person that I always saw to be a leader. When I first joined his choir, I didn't know how to carry a note, and he'll sit on that piano, very good piano player, very good piano player. He'll sit on the piano and say, hit this note, Patricia, and then I'll hit the note, and he said, no, that's not good enough. He said, take it up higher. After about five, six years in the choir, he was able to take us to Louisville, Kentucky, where the choir did, that was our first travel, where he took the whole choir to Louisville, Kentucky, and we performed over there for Pastor Francis' son. He had a church, he was the pastor of the church in Louisville, and we performed there. He did choir on a level that we are still hoping, somebody say amen, to do choir ministry on. While I was always older than he was, <laughs> he had this kind of a, a thing about him, which put him in a category beyond his years. My first, um, I think, meeting with him had to do with, with, with uh, Summerfest. You know, they were, Summerfest really had its foundation in the uh, Union uh, Baptist churches and the bishop coming out of uh, First Baptist, they had this particular connection. So some of us um, 
was one of the major young people's programs in the country. And one of the fellas in there was Neil Ellis. Um, back in the day also, there was a youth choir um, situation where every church had a youth choir, which churches didn't have a youth choir, were part of associations, uh, youth choir, or, 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 or some fellowships, youth choir. And Bishop uh, was a singer back in the day. I didn't know he used to play the piano every now and again, but I got to find out much later. But um, uh, there were a couple of songs that everybody sang. And one of them was uh, James Cleveland's Master the Tempest is Raging. Now, I was out of Mission Baptist Church. Uh, Dr. William Thompson was our choir, choir director. Uh, and I thought I had the best uh, Master the Tempest because I think I had the James Cleveland voice right now. Um, and then there was uh, St. Paul's. Um, they had the major piano player among the young people at that time. And then there, there, there was the Union Churches. And Bishop, with his lighter voice, used to do the master, the tempers is raging. But, but that is what qualified your choir back in the day, being able to sing, the winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Bishop could have killed that peace, peace be still there. But I, I think I had them uh, on the, the way we started off. You know, James Cleveland got master, and I think I killed them on that master. And then outside of that, uh, there was the concert scene. Where in that day, every Sunday was a concert. Every Sunday was a concert on Paradise Island. Uh, was the major thing. You'd be out in the Crown Ballroom or you'd be in the Holiday Inn. There were the concerts there um, every weekend. And the, the, the three people doing those concerts were uh, Bishop, well, that was, that was Neil Ellis. Neil Ellis was a concert fellow. Or, or, or Arnold Josie or Helen McPhee. I met him, I think at that time he was the president of the youth or, or the director of the youth uh, there at First Baptist. And as a young man, like all other young, um, we call them millennials now, uh, wherever something was happening, they would have been there. And so our church, Faith Baptist was right down a few steps from his church. And so whenever we were having something, you would always see that group from Faith, from First Baptist. Uh, so the face was very, very, um, you know, known. And then uh, as time went on, my daughter, when I really and truly got in, uh, uh, with him, close working with him, was my first daughter, uh, Kim. Kim insist that she really wanted him to be a part of her wedding. And so she, so I said, well, okay, what part do you want him to play? And she said, I want him to emcee my wedding. And really that was an unforgettable moment. Uh, and from that, our relationship just continued to grow. And wherever a concert was, well, there was Helen McPhee and there was a, a, a Neil Ellis. Um, not to say that he was taking part at that point in time, because uh, prior to that, he had his time of emceeing concerts, I believe, being young and moving around in the Baptist. Of course, you know, he talks very much about his spiritual father, uh, Dr. Saunders. And so he was mentored by him. And so he was known in the Baptist community. And so with me being a part of the Baptist community as well, we continued to buck heads. And of course, I observe him see the way he operates. And I said, boy, this young man is going to become something to reckon with. I always knew it. And so um, and really I became, uh, after being encountering so many times 
uh, we just got like this. If I were to show, you know, just, and of course I was a spiritual mother. That was my spiritual son. As he progressed in adulthood, working in a local business and making strides in ministry, the now young man would meet a young lady who would become his covenant partner and chief supporter for his life and ministry. So the very first time I would have seen him would have been during a speech contest that was sponsored by the Business and Professional Women's Organization many years ago. I must have been 14, 15 years old, somewhere around there. And so I was representing my public school, AF Adderley. Um, and Neil, of course, was representing his alma mater, St. John's College. And so we met on stage. Um, the subject, interestingly enough, for the speech contest was a woman's places in the home. So I, of course, went ahead and memorized my speech. Neil had his script with him. To cut a long story short, he won the speech contest. And I believe that he only won because during my presentation at one point, I literally forgot my lines. That's the only reason I think he won. He would think otherwise. Eventually, as Neil progressed being the youth choir director, then somehow I was singled out to be the assistant choir director. I was a lead singer in the choir and um, Neil was always very disciplined and structured. I recall being sent home from choir rehearsal in the name of you're talking too much, you're being disruptive. Um, yeah, like literally sent home. And so, of course, I had to, you know, do what I was asked. Lady Patrice was always a part of the choir. Good voice. She always sang well. And he always will give a lead role to sing. And then I think because they started to, she became the choir director, assistant choir director. So because she became the assistant choir director, they became closer. So they had a friendship first. And then we noticed things getting a little tighter. He never said nothing, but we noticed them getting closer and closer and closer. And then eventually they became a couple. I recall Neil and I literally having an introduction to business class together. Didn't sit near each other or anything, but interestingly enough, we had a lecturer, well, professors, what we call them now, by the name of Mr. Peter Daniels who somehow saw something between Neil and myself. And literally one night, I recall him saying, in the introduction to business class, he said, you two, there's something about you, and I think you two are gonna get married. He had no idea that we were friends. He had no idea that we even knew each other. In the year 1980, at the young age of 19, Neil Ellis was asked to take on the temporary position of general manager at Chicken Unlimited Restaurant as the company was in the process of dissolution. But instead of facilitating the closure, under his transformational leadership, he propelled the company into record-breaking profits, resulting in two new locations and several awards from the international franchise holders. Neil took that company from losing money, losing money, when Neil took that over. To the next year, it went to this. The next year to this. When Neil took over, there were two outlets. There was one on Mackey Street, and there was one on Independence Drive. Neil took the company such that within a short period of time, it went to four, four uh, outlets, including two newly built outlets. And so, during that period of time, that's where Neil and my relationship in particular went like even yet to another level because in, in, in terms of professional life, my wife was the teacher in the classroom. Now he's in business. And so now I become the mentor teacher in business. Reverend Ellis 
was a great mentor for me during my time at Chicken Unlimited. He taught me to be disciplined. He taught me to with good customer service, how to interact with team members. The fact that he was firm, but he was always very fair. And he believed in staff development. Bishop Ellison, my humble opinion, was a man of great status. He was kind, he was caring. Um, he, had the, he had the ability to push Chicken Unlimited where he wanted it to go. When I first started Chicken Unlimited, um, and Bishop came to Chicken Unlimited, I was a cashier. Because of who Bishop was, who I knew him to be, caused me to follow him and I knew he would have been a great pastor and a great leader. I can truly say that working at Chicken Unlimited during the years, we had to be excellent at all times, especially when working the drive through In the second month at that store, he had Bible study and he invited the members of staff to his house who wanted to come. And I, I was one of them that went. The first Bible that I ever owned, and I forgot it, is, was given to me by him that I ever owned a Bible. During that period of time, he's getting into ministry a little bit. He's, pre, you know, he's with, with, with Reverend Francis. And then he and uh, Reverend Sabine Hall developed a relationship. And at the time, it is through Neil that what is now New Covenant Baptist Church started in a part of Chicken Unlimited on Mackey Street. His business acumen, his wizardry, his ability, his administration, and his ability to, to move things and to cause things to happen. We were in the basement at New Covenant, the bottom floor, which is now our preschool. We were down in the hill, and we were there for about two years and couldn't get out. And me with my hasty self, that's when I found out how many banks there were in the Bahamas, because I've been to all of them, and they tell me no. But Bishop Ellis came, and I always remember this about him. He was with us at the time, and he said, give it to me. And I handed it over to him, and he used his business sense to uh, take us out of the basement and we are on the top of the hill as we are now. Doing the will of God comes with a price. What do you do when God says to you, leave your home and all its comforts, your family, and go to a land that I will show you? Many are called, but few are chosen. The story is told in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10 of Jesus directing a rich young ruler to give up all he had for the sake of the gospel. Sadly, he was not able to perform that part of his financial security. This is not the story of Bishop Ellis, who received the instruction to give up his financial security on more than one occasion. His first such instruction was to leave a successful career to begin Mount Tabor Union Baptist Church, where he would serve as the full-time senior pastor. This necessitated him leaving a salary of $80,000 per year as the general manager of Chicken Unlimited for one of $16,000 per year at the church. The second instruction was given three years later when God instructed him to give up his salary completely at the church. Through these experiences, God taught him to trust the leading of the Holy Spirit no matter what he called him to do. This is a trait that has defined him throughout his 40 years of pastoring. I saw the Lord making every effort toward the end of ensuring, as his word says, you do what I ask you to do, you give me your 10%, I will open up the windows of heaven, I will pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. I will make men give unto your bosom, that's scripture. He didn't say men from where, and most times the men were not from here. Even though here, meaning Bahamas, specifically Mount Tabor, is where most of the service was done. But he, may, he, as in God, made sure 
that we had everything that we needed. To the observer, the call to walk alongside a great leader as a helpmate is understated. Lady Patrice Ellis, Bishop Ellis's wife of 39 years, has been recognized as Bishop Ellis's greatest supporter. My mother's been beside my father from the very beginning, and to see how close they've been for so long, it's really impactful to me to see a relationship that they have. And it's honestly set, a, set an example for me on how marriage should be. She, I think, has chosen to be Bishop's helpmate in so many ways. And she is pleased with that role. She sees that as a role that she is called to do, and she does it with excellence. Bishop Ellis was graced with a wonderful wife. Um, again, he and his wife um, really were true exemplars of, of, of marriage life and, and partnership. And it was clearly a very public one. And um, the elegance and of the presence of Lady Ellis um, was another magnificent part of, of his offering, really, as a pastor, um, because um, she was obviously fiercely loyal to him, manifested that loyalty in every possible way she could, both here and abroad. Um, and I've seen them in, in such circumstances. And, uh, and she graced him, really, with a, a level of confidence in knowing that he was protected by his partner. The level of respect and regard that I have for Bishop Neil Ellis is because firstly, in my mind's eye, I have come to realize that he is a servant of the Most High God. And if I do not do what I'm supposed to do effectively, the kingdom suffers. I can't play with that. I want, at the end of the day, my ultimate aim, if I am working for anything, my ultimate aim at the end of the day is I want God to be pleased with his decision to place Neil Ellis in my care. He's very loving and very funny all the time. And um, he, he loves Family Feud, and we're very competitive about that. The Family Feud, and then there's a show on GSN Game Show Network called America Says. And every time I say, I think I have the right answer, he says that's not not necessarily the right answer, but we're very competitive there. And but overall, I think he's um he he's a loving loving father. He's a loving husband to my mom as well, and he sacrifices so much for his family, and he he honestly would give the world for his family. What you see now is what he was then, straight through. Don't mind what he's accomplished locally, globally, etc. Neil is Neil. And I think that's one of the things that makes him so special. Um, because regardless of whatever he does or achieve, growing up, starting from way back when, he has met, it was always him. He was always consistent. And so one thing I would add though, when Neil did get married to Patrice, I did get his room, so that's like, that's like the turnover as well. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you, Patrice. We are all encouraged to be, you know, Christ-like and to, to, to live in a way where through actions, through the way we are, we show the love of Christ, then I think that's what our brother Neil does. So for me, what Neil was accomplishing was coming home at the end of the day with a bag of candy for me. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that, that's what I know was happening when I was growing up. You know, you see that car come in the driveway and I'm running downstairs because Neil's home. And I know we have a little brown paper bag and I know what's in it. You know, for us, our break, big brother was a lot of fun. He was so lively. Um, he always played the piano. 
And so on Christmas morning, uh, we would come downstairs and after we opened our gifts, we had carols around the tree with our brother Neil playing the piano. Um, and whatever, whatever song we started to sing, he would just play along with, you know? And, um, and now, every Christmas, we still have Christmas carols. And if he's not playing, he's organizing the music, you know? So that love and the support that he contributed to in our home growing up, he continues to contribute to um, today. And Uncle Neil, I would probably say, may even be better than Big Brother Neil. <laughs> um, because his nieces and nephews adore him. We didn't grow up with a father, so we didn't know what it was like to have um, a man at the head of our lives, um, a man that covered our lives. And so it was a little, I don't know, different to have a man, like a real man of integrity, speak into our lives from a place of authority. I love you very much. Um, you have been such an inspiration to all of us. And, and for me, I see so much love, so much wisdom, so much passion in you. Uh, you're so generous, as Michelle alluded to, and everything about you just speaks of quality character, uh, kingdom character. And so congratulations on your next chapter. All the best to you. I love you very much from the bottom of my heart. You are definitely a father and a man to be reckoned with. I believe that there are so many people that have similar stories of how Bishop Ellis has impacted their life. But I know for me personally, from the time that I met him, doors started opening and doors have not closed. Um, he's just a man that, I mean, when I look at him, I see God, honestly. Um, I see fatherhood, I see legacy, um, I see love. Um, yeah, he's a man that challenges you, loves you. Um, he has no problem chastising you and mm. pushing you to greatness. Mm -hmm. And I love that about him. I think of all the late night conversations all of us have had sitting in a restaurant somewhere, yeah, somewhere around the world where Bishop Ellis will literally stay up for two or three hours after he's preached a sermon just to pour into our lives That's right. and give us what we need for that season. So yeah. Bishop Ellis, I love you so much. We love you. Uh, having had no brothers, I had no brothers. He's got a house full of brothers, but I never had a brother. And to see this man as literally a gift from God to my life, to my family life, uh, to my ministry, um, is to acknowledge the favor of God on my life. Uh, I thank God for you as a friend. I know as a colleague and we do the ministerial thing and the bishop thing and the hats and all that stuff, but as a friend, the ability to just talk um, from the hard places, to walk with each other through the hard seasons and the hard times, to see friends come and friends go, uh, but then to see God continue to bind us together. Um, you, you're shorter than I am and you're younger than I am, but uh, I, I really look up to you as a big brother. Um, don't take that too far, but just know that I love you, man, and I see you as an expression of God's love on my life. Starting in a humble setting in a meeting room of Chicken Unlimited, the then Reverend and Sister Alice obeyed God's voice. It cost them everything, but the vision of an empowered church kept them pressing forward. In 1987, the church was chartered with 11 members who held their initial services at the meeting room of the Bahamas National Baptist Missionary and Educational Convention headquarters on Blue Hill Road. Mount Tabor Church from back then to now, in our Blue Hill Road days, we were truly a united family where everybody knew everyone's name. Um, and it was a coming together almost every Saturday. I can remember us having uh, cookouts where every member of the church, because we were small at the time, uh, attended the cookouts and, you know, gave support and gave assistance wherever they could. They soon outgrew the meeting room at the Bahamas National Missionary and Educational Convention headquarters, moving to tent meetings on the property that would become the home of the church in Pinewood Gardens. 
Although rewarding, the early days of ministry were quite challenging, from being locked out of a designated space for service, to water leaking through the ceiling of an incomplete church building, to borrowed choirs and more. But in spite of these challenges, the young church under the spiritual leadership of Pastor Ellis persevered. We had some good services in there, but he never let us get comfortable in there. Every time we, we met, he was talking about getting a piece of property and getting out of there. Um, so we, we didn't, we, we were not, plus after a couple of weeks, we, we really outgrew that building because uh, members were joining so quickly, you know, so we, we had to get out of there. For Mount Tabor to get off the ground, he was actually offered a piece of property. And that property was on Carmichael Road. It was part of the union property. They wanted him to go down there and get started. Uh, but for some reason, his thing was that's not what the Lord showed him. And so we ended up on this existing property where we are now. Of course, this was a lake, so everybody was laughing at him as to what he's going to do. I mean, we had to fill in the ground with so many loads of fill uh, to bring the level up to what it is now. And I remember in our old days, of course, we came on this property with a tent um, and you had to fight the weather uh, with the tent, cleaning, cleaning seats every day, that kind of stuff. The tent blew down a number of times. As a matter of fact, when the tent came down one time, somebody ended up taking some stitches. And I think the tent came down one more time. And that's when Bishop Ellis pulled the tent down <laughs> and decided that enough was enough. Uh, we move into what is our administrative building now. No windows, no doors. And his thing was the tent didn't have any window. The tent didn't have any doors. So let's go in. And I believe it was the Honorable Janet Boswick uh, during a meeting or an official service we, we had here. We had to keep moving up because every time we move or the rain would drop right where she was, right where she was. And so we moved her again. As soon as we moved her, uh, the rain came down again. But again, that did not discourage uh, what was known then as Reverend Neil Ellis from moving forward in ministry. He had a determination to make things different at Mount Tabor and uh, no little rain was going to stop it. Within the first year we had, we had enough for women where we felt we, we can now have a, a women's day service. So we were, we were in a glee for that. Bishop gave us the okay. He said he would bring in a guest, a preacher for us and we just set up the service and we did that. So we invited friends, we invited family members we invited co-workers to join us in this service and we fasted and we prayed and we were looking forward to that when we got to the church sunday morning <laughs> the building was locked we couldn't get in and our spirits dropped and you know we were you know we, we were disappointed um we were embarrassed you know but um bishop I uh, looked up and he he saw a door and up, upstairs of the building and he told uh, one of the young men who was with us, he said, uh, go and see if that door is open. And the young man went and the door was open and Bishop led the way, he said, you all follow me. And we followed him and when we opened the door, it was, it was just a corridor, a narrow corridor. So he said, well, this way we can have church today. And so we crammed that building and <laughs> We had a powerful praise and worship. One thing that, that um, stands, um, that still is in my mind is when we, went, when we got started uh, in service, um, I remember one Sunday morning, right in the middle of the service, Bishop asked the question, how many of you uh, got baptized? Um, not because you were saved, but because your parents felt that you were at the age where you wanted, where you should be baptized. So you were forced to get baptized, but you were not saved. So he asked us to show our hands and we did. And it was so many of us, he asked us to come to the altar. So we went to the altar and, and when, he, when he looked up, it, it was really the whole church. So um, he prayed for us and then he asked us if we were ready to rededicate our lives to those of us who were not saved if we were ready to get saved and we did 
And so he said, we, we got to fix this. And so one Sunday morning at five o'clock, we went to Sanders Beach where Bishop baptized the whole church. We all got baptized over. Uh, the amazing thing about it is uh, we had you had the one deacon getting baptized. You had the church secretary. You had the treasurer. You had Sunday school teachers. We all um, went and got baptized again. And um, the important thing I saw in that was uh, Bishop. He he was always concerned about us getting to know the God of the week instead of getting bogged down in the wake of the church. And he's still like that today. Let me talk about the, uh, what, we, what we called um, the moving revival. Okay. This was another time when uh, we, um, okay, we, we, had planned, we had planned our first revival. Okay, uh, we fasted, we prayed. Uh, we got to, uh, it was a three night service, um, three nights of preaching, praise and worship, Bishop was gonna speak. And the first night of this, uh, the revival, we got to the, to the sanctuary and the floor was up. That was the week um, the convention decided they were going to repair the floor and they didn't let us know. So once again, um, Bishop took charge. He said, give me one minute. And he got on the phone and he made a call. And when he came back, he said, follow me. And so we got in our cars and we ended up at Salem Baptist Church. That was the first night. Uh, the second night um, was at uh, Faith Baptist on uh, Market Street, Faith Baptist slash uh, Boston Square, because in the middle of, 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 of his sermon, he was led for us to go on in Boston Square. So we followed him and um, we, we, had, we finished the service in Boston Square. I remember two tourists got saved. That night, I remember us when, when we were closing, um, we were told, Bishop said, you all join hands. And, and the crowd was so big, um, we went from the beginning of Rosson Square all the way around um, the statue of, of Sir Milo. The police was on duty and he joined and he, you all had a man of God, close the cycle. The local church and state of the country a charge to keep, I have a cross to carry and a God to glorify. Bishop Ellis's voice rang out throughout the nation. His Sunday morning radio programs challenged people to put aside their Sunday morning norms of going to the wash house, cleaning their homes and cars and back into church. I could remember as a little boy and he much older than me, we were living in Cat Island and early in the morning, this some could be some 45 years ago, he used to say, get up, come go to church and don't touch that dial. From the words he say, motivate us to go to church. He inspired me from I was in Cat Island. Neil Ellison come company, pop chop, down. Last load, last load, put everything down, down, get ready to go to church. So he's the first fellow. Uh, I'm telling everybody to go to church on, 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 on a Sunday morning. Ah, you shouldn't be there in that off now. You should be on your way to church. And people used to wait for that. And if you were in the food store at that time, you saw people actually following the instructions. Mount Tabor grew in popularity as the church's television ministry was used to carry the gospel throughout the Bahamas. Bishop Ellis's gift as a pioneer was displayed in his approach to ministry. Praise and worship and liturgical dance ministries introduced a new day and enthusiasm among churchgoers. The ministry attracted people from all walks of life as Bishop Ellis's ability to deliver his messages with simplicity and a prophetic anointing stirred up and strengthened the church. Ironically, some call the ministry a cult, not being able to comprehend a people coming together and working together for change in the spiritual and daily lives of Bahamians. I was quite impressed that a young man at the age that he was at the time had already accomplished a whole lot. When I came down here uh, to the church, um, some of the things I saw was organization and uh, Bishop Ellis appeared to, to be uh, somebody who believed in things being well organized. And I saw that almost immediately. 
One of the other things that, that I saw was excellence. He brought some, some new style into, into how we worship. And, and, and all denominations adopted it. You know, it may not say so, but they, they adopted uh, uh, some of the styles that he brought into, into worship. I don't, I don't think people understood um, his approach to ministry. And I don't think they understood what it was that God was directing and leading him to do. I think it's beyond doubt that he led the way in the use of technology in conveying the gospel. We're all in the Great Commission given at the end of Matthew. We are all commissioned to go out and present the gospel to all the world. But the use of technology that he employed intentionally both for radio and television on a consistent basis, provided a wider expanse of the presentation of the gospel. And the willingness to use that technology in the service of God, uh, he has given a, what I call a, a leading example of how that is to be done. I also sensed at the time that there was some jealousy um, because as a young man, he was really progressing and uh, Montebo was, was really beginning to move, even in the early days. And um, so I think, you know, people criticized uh, him and uh, criticized Montebo, but they did it from the outside. Most people never really came to a service. They never really came to something so that they can see for themselves what was happening and what was going on and what God was doing above, above all else. We were doing a lot of um, road evangelism, street evangelism. One of the things Bishop Ellis did uh, in his wisdom was Pinewood Garden as a constituency uh, literally became 10 different constituencies for Mount Tabor. And I remember times where we would send 10 leaders into 10 areas with 10 people and we were able to cover almost 2,500 to 3,000 homes in the Pinewood Garden. We were able to cover them uh, in, uh, in one hour because of the massive uh, group of people that we sent out. And I, I remember quite vividly uh, during one of those times that we did that, we also, um, I stayed at the office with a group of 10 and the pastors as they ran out or the leaders as they ran out, they would call and say, uh, Pastor Ellis on Jacaranda Street, house number, whatever the house number is, they have three kids, they don't have any lunch for tomorrow. And right away we would mobilize that and make that happen. And then we had this thing called the bomb squad, which was bring our members back. And so we had a group that w that go out. We had the uh, the nightclub crew. Uh, we would go in the clubs. We would go on the dance floor. Uh, we would sit to the bar and order Shirley Temple. And we would dance on the side of Shirley Temple, I say. That's what I said. Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple. That's what I said, all right? Uh, so we would order uh, Shirley Temple and witness at the same time. So that was fresh and new. People didn't expect Christians to invade them. Then we, were in, we would invade uh, the drug houses, those who were uh, on drugs, we would do that. Then we had 24 hour uh, calls. We would have people on the street late at night and then somebody would stay here uh, to call. So there were so many different things that was going on. We started uh, the school uh, with the ABECA system and now that's almost common in the Bahamas now. But initially, Mount Tabor was one of the first uh, schools, I believe, outside the USA uh, that used the ABECA system as a curriculum uh, for preschool. So we had the preschool rolling, uh, we had evangelism rolling, uh, we had a uh, uh, benevolent element of us rolling. Then we had this dance ministry going on. Oh, Lord, we were a cult then. When we start the dance ministry, when we start praise and worship, not song service, we started praise and worship. And so I believe also uh, pretty much in the Baptist church, if not uh, in the whole charismatic Pentecostal situation here in the Bahamas, praise and worship really came out of this ministry. 
And uh, they call us all kind of things. They said Bishop Ellis was leading the cult, that kind of thing. Now all of a sudden, everybody got dance ministry. Everybody got a praise and worship team. As a matter of fact, some people got three and four dance ministry uh, at their church. But these were some things that were started uh, right here by then uh, Pastor Neil Ellis of Mount Tabor Church. He was a critical tinker. He always thought of what could have made people better. He always looked at, for instance, with the credit card, when he did that, I mean, that was legendary. Nobody else thought about that. And to get you to get a debit card, people who never could have get a bank account, now a debit card, then to do the insurance, it's like he sit down and he look, he try to look for what's gonna make people life better. And so he come up with these ideas and you'd be like, wow, how come nobody else thought about that? But so many things is, has happened with Bishop Ellis as it relates to his international ministry. Uh, he has taken many groups uh, to Israel because he loves traveling, many groups to Greece. Uh, he took a group of pastors and subsequently another group to the Vatican. Uh, so, so many people was exposed internationally by Bishop Ellis. He gave also so many people a platform internationally because of the conferences, because of the travel, uh, because of walking in victory. Uh, as a matter of fact, walking in victory was held in Israel uh, one year and then two years walking in victory was held one year on a carnival cruise ship and on another year on the Holland America uh, cruise line. So of course you could see the innovation, uh, you could see the creativity uh, from Bishop Ellis, always trying to do something fresh, always trying to do something new. And that's who Bishop Neil Ellis uh, was and still is today, always trying to be on the cutting edge of ministry. He's very humble and he has a huge heart and he's very sincere. And I think when you see those characteristics, they exude um, in a person like him. Um, he walks into a room and he's Neil Ellis. You, he doesn't go ahead and say, this is who I am and this is how you have to revere me or respect me. Um, my family knew him as my friend and <clears throat> they embraced him as my friend. And so it's the kind of information that he disseminates and what he teaches and how he teaches it. And, but he lives it. Um, he has that human touch. Bishop Ellis, you know, you were the one that really introduced us to Tyler Perry, right? That's and right. so the Tyler Perry connection was one of the connections that propelled our career to really the status it is now and beyond. So you have um, genuine right. abilities in your touch and your connectivity. What you touch turns to gold and I'm so proud to be your family member. I'm proud to be your daughter. I'm proud that my brothers are your sons. Um, dare I say I'm your favorite daughter? Yes, I'll say that. <laughs> I'm proud to be your favorite daughter. Um, and again, doors continue to open because of my connection to you. I love you so much and um, happy retirement. You're just, you're a wonderful man. I, I don't even know what to say. Like if I say any more, I'll start crying. And I know that you don't like to see the ladies cry. So I'm not gonna say anything <laughs> else, but, but I love you. I love you. We've had uh, an artist or a talent that we work with, Devon Franklin over to um, your um, panel discussion that you had in Nassau. But oh, for every, the Global United Fellowship, hey, the gathering, yeah. Everyone that is included in something that you're doing always gets a professional touch, which also speaks to how you govern your staff. So you're a leader in so many different ways and everybody gets the benefit of how great you are. So, I mean, we could go on and on about how great you are, but what you've done, Michelle mentioned it, has opened our career up and I just want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being such a wonderful, kind man and, uh, and being a leader. Yeah. But I do want to see you on stage doing comedy at some point because you are very <laughs> He's funny. funny. He is man. definitely funny. Everyone knows it. So 
<laughs> now, I do need to set some ground rules here. And I've tried to observe this, and he broke this rule one time. My brother, don't, don't do this again. Now, the rule is, when I come to Mount Tabor, I'm going to be me. When you come to Faithful Central, you be you. Now, you, you messed up one time, and I'm just telling you, don't, don't do that again, because you messed these people up. They ain't been right since, okay? What, well, here's what you did. Okay, watch this now. So that means now, faith, I don't like to talk like this, because when I talk like this, I get like in Bishop Alma's mode. Now faith is both substance and evidence. Did you get that? Did you get that? Did you get that? No, you didn't get it. Gotta give it to you again. Gotta give it to you again. Gotta give it to you again. Faith. Why practice a long time for that? Bishop has a pastor's heart. He has a heart for people. I have never met someone with a heart like Bishop Alice. I can't even describe the type of heart that Bishop Alice has. There have been times that me and my colleagues, we would ask him questions like, Bishop, why do you do this? Or why do you feel the need to do that? Because sometimes it goes just completely above above us, you know, goes like way beyond our thinking. Like we don't even understand why he would do certain things, but he just has a heart for people, a genuine heart for people. And the things he does for any and everyone, things that he would never even want people to know. It's just a heart for people just a pastor's heart. And he's full of love and full of life. A loving man. He, he, he makes you feel special. He makes everybody feel special. He's not a person, a person who would, who would, make, who would hurt people and make them feel like nothing, but he, he elevates people. So he's a, he's a loving man of God. And um, he's also, based on his works and his ministry, He's full of compassion, and it is compassion that drives people to do the right thing. It's compassion that drives ministry. You could be in ministry and not have compassion. Compassion drives us to help others to do what is right. And Bishop Ellis has that in, stored right up in him. He has a lot of it, and he displays it. Bishop Ellis was there for me as I laid in North Carolina on the hospital bed after enduring a nine hour surgery. Bishop Ellis was there for me to inspire me, to encourage me, pray with me. And um, I would watch his sermons every Sunday morning for the last year and a half at 7.15 a.m. Those messages are what got me up out of that bed of affliction. Bishop Ellis was there for me not just spiritually as, a, as an inspiration, but he was there temporarily also with financial support, with encouragement, with love. He's a true man of God. In 2020, we experienced something in this country where things were so hard and things were so rough. Bishop Neil Ellis make a call and Purity Bakery up until this day is give us bread to feed those poor people. When I could not find my way, one time all light was cut off. And when I spoke to Bishop Neil Ellis, he said, no, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't go on the TV and cry like that. Use the church. Well, I had to cry to him. My God, let me tell you something. The man said, look, you come. That's one pastor. He always write a tangible check to help feed them people. That's Bishop Neil Ellis feeding through the same corner. No long a couple of weeks ago, that same man of God, he said, what do you want? I'm too ashamed to tell him what I want. He said, let the Lord lead you. And he would say, come. Sometimes he don't even be here. 
and we get the check to feed the massive of people. If we could pour that back into him, if he could feel our love for him, I think it would be tremendous. Because the moments when we didn't have, when we didn't have a dollar, when we needed a couple of dollars, and I could call Bishop Neil Ellis, the times when I needed a word, when I needed to be lifted because I felt so depressed, when I thought I was losing all that I had worked on, I thought that I didn't have the capacity to go to another step, I called Bishop Ellis. And each time it was him giving, him stopping whatever he's doing, him telling you come by, him saying, I'm gonna pray for you, him offering you advice, him cause you to understand what true love is. And if I can give him the love that he gave me, I'd be a much better person today. But our country certainly celebrates his incredible career, incredible gift that God gave him and the fact that he's used it for all. And the example he set, God gives you a gift. Be obedient to God, follow his word, and make this world a better place. In Neil Ellis, I see Christ. I see Christ. Neil's heart is so huge. And most times I don't know of the stuff that he does. But I learn from watching him. I learn from his doing. I'm better because of Neil. I'm a better Christian because of Neil, not because I read my Bible, but because I watch Neil Ellis. And I see how God returns to him. I see how God blesses him because of how he follows Christ. And I want that for myself. I want that for myself. My only concern over the years, and if I could find one fault or complaint with Neil, it would be his heart. Not in a bad way. It's hard because it is so large. It is so open. It is so free to everyone. And one of my concerns is the fact that I feel that people can take advantage of that. My husband doesn't feel that anyone can take advantage of him. But I fear, and, and I'm oftentimes concerned that people will take advantage of his heart because they know that at the end of the day, no matter what they do to him, no matter how they bring him down, no matter how they try to bring him down and drag his name through the mud, that if those same people at some point in time find the need to make their way to Bishop Neil Ellis, they know that the door will always remain open for them. And so I think one of the questions that I often ask him is, Neil, you do so much for people, like who is going to be there to do this same thing for you? And his response to me always is, God will take care of me. And God always has a ram in the bush trees. You cast your bread upon the water and it shall return to you after many days. With the unprecedented growth experienced in his ministry, he drew personal attacks at this time designed to demoralize him and ultimately this church. The night that the attack happened, me, and Neil and Patrice was in Lauderdale together. And the next morning, Neil said, come go with him. He's planning on getting a ring for Patrice to do a renewal. And me and him went out to Zales Jewelers and he was shopping for a new ring. The night they said that happened. So after hearing all the other attacks from the punch, it never bothered me, because I said, well, I said, but Patrice, how this happened? How this happened? And you and Neil in, in Lauderdale. And I said, well, looking like, like some of the pastors say, looking back at that talk, that was to, to slow his ministry down. Bishop Ellis um, is not a man who panics. And um, he knows um, how to handle crisis very well. And I think that is something that a lot of people 
do not understand. And like he always says, sometimes you don't need to make a comment on situations that are uh, tragic or that are hurtful because it will eventually, God will know how to handle it and he'll take care of it for you. Personally, I knew what was being said was only that aroma. And I keep my faith grounded. I always pray for him. I said, I don't know where he get the stability from to even go through this and still come on the pulpit and preach that it doesn't phase him. I mean, if it phase him, he doesn't show it. And I know things like this knock people down a lot, but he just continued to run. And I think that was a motivator for me that if they could do this to you, man of God, and you could still keep pushing and pushing, that pushed me that when people start to do these things to you, you know God has created for you. And I think that's what motivated me to keep pushing with it. He realized that uh, the higher he goes, there would have been challenges. And so when the challenges come, when the name calling, and when the lies and everything else was called, thank God he had persons like myself who knew it was going to be prayer. Prayer was the key. God gave him a wife who was there and understand the call that, that was on his life. And God gave her the grace to be able to be there, a shoulder for him to lean on. If you do not have the right wife, if you do not have people to pray, then you you, we, we, we in problems, we in trouble. I cried a tear, you wiped it dry. I was confused, you cleared my mind. I saw my soul. But thank God he had those components there to, to carry out that, that part of the journey. All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. As Mount Tabor's popularity increased, so did its involvement in the voice in national affairs. It was not just limited to a political organization like the Progressive Liberal Party. He was able to rise above the political divisions and to be able to, at the request of prime ministers, tender his advice, his wise counsel, and even when it was opportunistic for him to do so, to volunteer help and assistance to those who led our country, whoever they may have been and whatever they may have been. I've used Bishop Bellas as an inspirator. I've used him when I've had my difficult moments. I've used him when I needed help and support. And he's always been there. Always been there and always been an advisor, but not giving you the answer you want, but giving the answer that you needed and guiding you along the way and along the path to make you a better person. When I was an MP uh, in the area, in the Pinewood area, of course I would not have dared to come into Pinewood without consulting first with Bishop, who is, as I shared, as a mentor in my life. Well, you notice something about Bishop Neil and Neil. 
he didn't become a politician. But what he did do is became a kingmaker. He advises politicians. He stands in the gap. He intercedes. He gives dutiful and wise counsel to many leaders on both sides of the political divide. I would say on three, four sides of the political divide. And, and he played that role also in my life. And so for me, early in my aspiration about political life, he was one of the persons I spoke to and he was able to give me wise counsel as to what he feels um, I am most suited for. And in particular, um, in 2012, when I was fortunate to have won this, the Gardner's constituency, and Neil played a, a, a very instru instrumental role in helping to craft that, and also in, in, in my selection and appointment and eventual election as, as Speaker of the House of Assembly. I remembered it very, very vividly. From time to time, uh, various persons in leadership, from prime ministers to members of parliament, and even uh, persons at the ground level in, in, in local government have called upon him for his sage advice. And so, um, again, Bishop, as a praying man, he comes to whatever situation prayed up, and he's got the, the, the direction and guidance straight from the throne room. When Zedekiah, king of Judah, was uncertain about the future of his people, he sent for the prophet Jeremiah and asked, Is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, There is. Today in the postmodern Bahamas, there are still a few who command the attention of all in our national affairs. And our national leaders have shown over the years that if there is only one religious leader who can be counted upon to deliver a word from the Lord, he is Bishop Neil C. Ellis, the founding pastor of Mount Tabor Church, and a global cleric who is respected and followed by church leaders around the world. People say, man, but listen to what this man saying. That, that, that the narrative about him being this substituting practical politics for the Bible, people say, I ain't seeing that. I'm not hearing that. And so people now, people gradually, regardless of their personal, partisan, political views, start saying, man, this, 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 this man talking sense. And so gradually, people started seeing this is a man of God more than they start seeing this is a man with any political agenda. Then what started to happen was something else started to happen. People started seeing Neil's bridge building skills. So, 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 mm -hmm. so different groups now, you and I have a dispute, we're fighting. We need a moderator, we need a go-between, we need somebody. And so one by one, little by little bit, people start, what about Bishop Ellis? And then Bishop Ellis started playing that role and, and started, boy, Bishop Ellis really did a good job for us now. He brought us together he did, in ways that I didn't think was possible. So where it started to spread, so where it starts to spread. And so the day in this country, today, in any serious national issue, where A and B are fighting, and they want an intermediary, Bishop Ellis is likely to be the name that comes, if not first to mind, among the first to mind. From a national point of view, he has been there for all Bahamians, and he's been what I call the consummate healer. He's been able to bridge divides that us politicians were unable to. I call him very frequently for advice and to 
engage his healing prowess to assist in the vibes that would exist in our organization, in our community, and the wider public service um, in the country. And so, Bishop Neil Ellis, I know that you have indicated that one must know when to move off the scene and to allow others to go. You are leading by example in that regard, and I trust I'll be able to follow your example when it's my turn. And so before I agreed, when I was invited to become an MP, I asked him what did he think and what was his advice to me? He warmly embraced me and the opportunity and encouraged me. Well, let's go to family. The park that we have in Pinewood, there are two parks actually. The one that has the track around it and Lake Pinewood, as we uh, built a second court, we put playgrounds in, all blessed by Bishop Ellis. One of the major things I believe that took place in Mount Tabor was when we were able to build a house in a service. I mean, we had people calling in for stuff, uh, saying for on the ship, and they were calling out, they were out to sea. I will do this, I will do the next thing. And that in itself springs something forward uh, in the people of Mount Tabor, where homes started popping up individually. And then something went off uh, in Bishop Ellis, and that was to start our own subdivisions. God used the church to bring revival to the country. For five days, churches in almost every island of the Bahamas, in an unprecedented show of unity, followed the leadership of Bishop Ellis for a movement of prayer, praise, and worship to heal the land. It was reported that during the five days these events were held, there were no reports of crime in the country. These events etched in Bahamian history, titled Revival is Here, and the ensuing five days ablaze, turned a nation back to God and on its knees. It proved that in the Bahamas was a leader sent by God as a voice to the nation and its leaders. Is there anybody here who loved this country? Is there anybody here who really believe God lives in the Bahamas? We'll prophesy a thing. Tell somebody around you, I declare right now, the Bahamas will not go down. They were times you cannot forget them. You cannot. What happened in Nassau was phenomenal. We, we, we had never seen, never seen anything like it before. And then to see it spread to some of the family islands and have the same kind of impact was also great to see. Level of speaker, speakers he would bring into the country. So he was always on a pioneering edge uh, from a church-based level, from a leadership level uh, in the nation, always setting a pace and, and, and uh, blazing a trail. Coinciding with national influence, Bishop Ellis also became a covering for many of the progressive local and international senior pastors following their request for him to serve as their spiritual covering. Bishop Ellis mentors and provides spiritual guidance to these senior pastors who he affectionately calls his sons and daughters in ministry. This grouping of sons and daughters is known as the House of Elijah. House of Elijah, that speaks of whom he is. House of Elijah, concern about the body of Christ, concern about lives and not just um, another message, another, no, another preaching engagement. But he was concerned about young men and young women coming up in the body of Christ that will carry the work of, the, of God on, preaching and teaching the Word of God. The thing about House of Elijah, Bishop was considered the father of the house. But in the House of Elijah, there were uh, uh, brothers and sisters older than them, <laughs> you know? So uh, uh, that, 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 that was a uh, straight, but really, I think it was the first place, uh, a first group other than the Christian Council, where you had a group of pastors come together on a regular basis 
passes was gonna uh, come together from across the normal national lines because it was just about backers. Uh, we had just about everybody you could take, uh, shake a stick at. Once their desire was uh, to follow the leadership of Bishop Ellis, they came. Bishop Ellis is an overseer of pastors in the highest order. There's been no glitch, no hiccup, no road bump that I've gone through in my life that Bishop Ellis gave me the counsel, the wisdom, the coaching, and the prayers that I needed. Transparently, Bishop Ellis was there when I had to go through uh, one of the most harrowing experiences of my life, which was my divorce. Bishop Ellis was there when I went through a dark season of uh, depression, trying to figure out uh, whether or not I should stay in ministry or whether my time has elapsed. Bishop Ellis was there. I'm grateful that I got a coach that always helps me make touchdowns after I've been tackled. On the international stage, his unique, spirited, life-changing messages raised the demand for him to minister around the world. Local conferences such as Week in the Word and Station Identification brought international pastors to the Bahamas for services that were always in overflow. Through Neil C. Ellis Ministries, the Bahamas would in turn take ministry to the United States and the world with the successful hosting of Walking in Victory conferences. I believe as a result of that program, Bishop Ellis uh, sat with Bishop George Bloomer uh, and a few others in the United States of America, a couple of us here in the Bahamas, uh, our brother who passed away, Pastor David Ellis. We all sat around the table and discussed, uh, can we put a conference together called Walking in Victory? And so Bishop Ellis unveiled a vision uh, for uh, Walking in Victory and what he wanted to do. Walking in Victory and seeing the progression of the ministry and knowing the sincerity of the work that Bishop Ellis does and has done and seeing the lives changed through his ministry has been phenomenal. Personally, I have gotten to witness um, the change um, of people's lives, traveling abroad, meeting new people and hearing them talk about their experiences through meeting Bishop Ellis and through the ministry of the Walking of in Victory, it's phenomenal. It's life-changing. Bishop Ellis became an ambassador for religious tourism in the Bahamas and attracted conferences and events to the Bahamian shores, which boosted the popularity and profitability of the Bahamas through the tourism product. When we won the elections in 2002, the Progressive Liberal Party and the Christian administration had a difficulty the world was just rebounding from 9-11. The question was, where do we go? Our principal industry has been the tourism industry, but the world is in search of tourism. The world has made tourism the number one industry. And so we were in a competitive world. What do you do next? Perry Christie decided that he wanted to talk with Neil Ellis. He wanted to communicate with him about a concept in his mind, religious tourism. It was the introduction to the black church in the main in the United States of America. The size and power of the churches, the discussions with Bishop and those leaders of churches he introduced me to enabled us to launch a new segment of tourism in our country that we call religious tourism. And I remember well when the press, um, newspaper, one in particular, sort of admonished us to think carefully about what we were doing because they did not see the wisdom of what I then was describing as religious tourism. But to his credit, Bishop Ellis was able to show me 
and demonstrate to me that just getting a Sunday school to come from one of these churches was a powerful intervention in the economy of the Bahamas. I was lost at first, to be honest with you, because in my mind, well, they're Christians. They'll come to an event and go to church. I didn't know at the time that the highest spend were from the religious community, that whenever they came to hotel, there was more spend. Whatever they did in hotels, there was much more spend, that they impacted economies such an enormous way. And then we came to understand that Bishop Ellis had started the Christian movement and the religious tourism movement in his own church, that he had conferences, repetitively conferences, and what was happening was he was filling hotel rooms at a time when the hotel industry had not rebounded, particularly during the slow or the shoulder months, as they call it, August, September, October. He had conferences, filling hotel rooms, contributing to the economy. His approach is very simple. We have to preach the word of God. We have to get people to believe in God. And then he saw the economic value. But at all times, the country is benefiting. While I was always aware of the role that Bishop Ellis played on a national level, it was only when I assumed this position that I understood the depth of his involvement in the tourism industry and his singular role in bringing the amount of business, coverage, and positive publicity to the Bahamas that he has. The amount of business that came into the Bahamas both directly and indirectly because of his far-reaching connections should never be forgotten because Bishop Neil C. Ellis has truly been a global tourism ambassador. The Ministry of Tourism had a very special relationship with Kathy Hughes and Radio One that was an introduction that was made through Bishop Ellis. Many will recall Bishop T.D. Jakes holding a crusade in Freeport and the large following of people who came to attend. This was because of Bishop Ellis. My introduction to the famed movie director, studio owner and actor Tyler Perry was through Bishop and Lady Ellis, as I am sure was the case for the majority of Bahamians. One of his most notable in his international associations was the Full Gospel Baptist Fellowship, for which Bishop Ellis rose to the ranks of first vice presiding bishop, the second most senior leadership role within that acclaimed body of believers. It was so pleasing from time to time to listen to the testimony of other spiritual religious leaders who spoke to their following Bishop Ellis and their admiring Bishop Ellis and, and in many instances they're deciding to be a part of as it was then full gospel um, fellowship that Bishop Ellis was an instrumental part of and and he and I watched him as he developed the full gospel connection here in the Bahamas and the, ch the church leaders that joined him and from time to time I would go with them to the conferences that they had and, and uh, most certainly speak at some of them. He was overseeing Neil Ellis uh, with responsibility for foreign ministries and the second year I believe it was that he preached and they could not believe uh, the delivery of the message the skill, the anointing, and the deliverance that took place in the Superdome. Um, and so when they saw that, they saw his teaching on the power of the blood, the check up from the neck up, the look around from the shoulder down, and also uh, understanding demons. These were classes that Bishop taught, and I mean people were looking through the doors because 500, 600 people would be in his class. There was never enough room. We spent 20 years there as a part of the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship and that was a tremendous opportunity, tremendous exposure, lots of great times. I mean, very spiritual events, etc. And we led a very large delegation on an annual basis um, to that convention. And so Full Gospel benefited from the Bahamas in a very, very large way. And Bishop Ellis, of course, being 
who he is never wants to do anything by himself and or not incorporate other people. And so that was an absolute great opportunity for him to incorporate Bahamians, um, expose Bahamians, get them involved in the fellowship in a direct way, have them as guest presenters at the fellowship, uh, because that's what he does. His thing is always about lifting people up and bringing them to a higher place. Bishop Neil Ellis took me to the world the man pay for the ticket, pay for the hotel room, pay for my food, and plus put money in my hands. There'll never be another Bishop Neil Ellis. I, I don't, I don't, well I pray God you know is a thing called Matt he could pass it over. But Bishop Neil Ellis ain't none like him. He happens to be one of my best friends. And going traveling with Bishop Neil Ellis, I've never really seen that kind of love. He showed me love. He showed me respect. You never be in the stone that the builder refused. You know what it is when people reject you? They scorn you. They, I don't know what position they put you in. But Bishop Neil Ellis never. Never. And that is exactly what happened for the 20 years. We were literally integrated into Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship in every capacity, in, from every level of function in that organization. There were Bahamians being represented. Many are called, but few are chosen. I'm Bishop Paul S. Morton, and I want to talk about one of the chosen ones that God has called. And that is Bishop Neil C. Ellis. I wanted to be able to share because I thank God for his life and for his service. Ah, you talk about a man of excellence. You talk about a man getting things done. And I am, I am a living witness because with him serving as second presiding bishop of the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship, I know how this man has the ability to bring people together. And I know as he prepares to retire from one of the greatest churches in the world, Mount Tabor, man of God, I wanna let you know that I appreciate you, I love you, I thank God for you. I know personally in 2005, how you called Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship together and made sure that all of my needs were met coming out of Hurricane Katrina. It was something like I've never seen before and you have been doing it. Well done, keep on keeping on. Oh, I know the mentorship program that you will have, people are going to be blessed just by sitting at your feet. Thank you, Bishop Neil C. Ellis, for being you. You helped make Full Gospel an international conference. Oh, Bohemians just coming from everywhere, everywhere, giving God the praise. So I just wanted to say thank you. I love you and enjoy your retirement. It's just close up a chapter, but not the book. Keep on keeping on. After 39 years of ministry and 20 years of serving in the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship, Bishop Ellis was next in line to become the presiding bishop of that fellowship. During that time, he has served the presiding bishop with a spirit of excellence and was a loyal supporter, advocate, and brother to him. Then, in an unexpected turn of events, the leadership post became subjected to an electoral process. This change started a conversation among members of the fellowship who were also shocked and dismayed by this decision and the way in which it was instituted. What made headlines, though, and caught the attention of those in Christendom was the response of Bishop Ellis to the fellowship and its leaders. Still bearing the weight of the disappointment by fellow ministers and faced with future plans now thwarted, Bishop Ellis gracefully and humbly removed himself as a candidate in the leadership race while declaring blessings for the new leadership. By doing this with no public outcry of unfairness or betrayal, he became a beacon of humility and a true man of God to the people around the world. 
His spiritual approach to this event and display of forgiveness to those who hurt him galvanized the support of pastors and people from as far away as Africa, Pakistan, and India who wanted to learn more about this mighty man of Christian valor from the Bahamas and formally align themselves under the leadership of Bishop Ellis in a fellowship that would be different from the status quo. After weeks of prayer, Bishop Ellis resigned from the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship as he was illuminated with a vision and he envisaged and pioneered the institution of a truly inclusive global movement. As a result, God's purpose of the test and the will of God were revealed. In August 2013, the Global United Fellowship was established and several weeks later, in an official ceremony that could be described as glory-filled, Bishop Neil C. Ellis was elevated to the office of presiding prelate. The young pastor that stepped out in faith and left all behind for a land the Lord promised to show him was about to lead the people of God into that promised land. Every component of ministry that Bishop Neil Ellis has been asked to spearhead, there has never been a model for it. There, there has never been one like it. Um, so there was always the having to start from scratch. Uh, God give you bits and pieces of information and then you have to take it from there. It was never everything laid out, step one, step two, step three, you go from there. The instruction is given and Neil then has to figure out. However, the instructions would be direct enough for you to know that this has to be something unlike what already exists. You would know that much. Prayer is, is one of the strong keys, one of the strong prongs of the fellowship. It is the foundation of our fellowship because it is led by a man of prayer who leads a congregation that he is, has, has also led to be a congregation of prayer. People who were leaders of churches who had to make a decision as to whether they join the global group would have to have confidence in his leadership. That spoke so powerfully for the leadership of Bishop Ellis that this island boy who has ascended to the very top in the spiritual realm internationally would be able to lead a global organization that continued to expand and continued to attract right, significant churches worldwide. And that speaks volumes. Bishop Neil Ellis carries the order and the oil that is in fact reflective of the New Testament mandate of what a bishop is supposed to be, needs to be, and has to be. Global United Fellowship is not blessed. We are spoiled to live in the same lifetime of not just a bishop, but a founder. When one considers how a disadvantaged boy would become a leader and minister to his nation and to leaders, ministers, and people around the world, the life and ministry of His Grace Bishop Neil Clarence Ellis will attest to a divine call of God, a call to an obedient servant, anointed to walk a highly challenging path with a life of sacrifice. God was always with him in his movement, and uh, he was blessed in many ways. If they would write history, backward or forward, up or down, Bishop Neil Ellis' name got to be in it. It's like the alphabet. You can't write spiritual or the church history without putting Bishop Neil Ellis. He has a call on his, on his life, and that call is to continue to promote, continue to, to, to catapult this gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything comes to an end. And I'm sure that when Bishop reflects on his life journey, that he will know in so 
many wonderful ways how God was able to reinforce whatever he was doing and to give him that certain belief that if he persevered, he would be a major impact, not just in one table, not just in the United States of America, but in his global ministry, the world. I salute him. I congratulate him. You have lived 35 years making ministry look like a breeze. And I'm sure it couldn't always have felt that way. So for the how you heeded God's word, I tell you a hearty congratulations. It has truly been an honor and a privilege for me to be able to see somebody with such dedication adhere to God's word the way that you have. As a brother, I want to encourage you. I want to tell you uh, that you've been a blessing to many more people than you believe you were. Uh, your name is synonymous in the Bahamas, uh, in America, and around the world. Thank you for living a life that has been a sermon. And thank you even more for putting the excellent words <laughs> to that sermon and through your words and in your actions, being an example for us all. God will find a way to use him to carry forward his work. And in that, I join with him in giving thanks for all that God has enabled him to accomplish. It's not his work, not his ingenuity, but what God has enabled him to accomplish as a result of God's Spirit working in him and working through him. The path you have blazed um, even goes way beyond religion. You have truly showed that uh, with leadership and good leadership, and as you have said in your sermons, the spirit of a leader can do. I thank you every day for your sacrifice, and every day I try to think of a way to give it all back to you and try to make you proud and you know, I would, I would give the world for you as well as I'm sure you would give it for me. And I, I love you, Dad, and just know that your sacrifice isn't in vain. We're at the end of 35 years, Neil. I am so excited. And I look forward to spending time with you. Um, that's from my heart. I've shared you with so many people. Over the years, it's all been good, but I look forward to spending more personal time with you and getting to know you in a different way. Uh, this has been an amazing journey. I have enjoyed being your partner, being your wife, being your friend, being your lover, being whatever else you want to call me. And I wish you all the best in life. You're such a great person. You're such a great human being. You've done so much for so many. And I just pray that you will live long enough and healthy enough to see the returns of the Lord to you. If when you give the best of your service, telling the world what the Savior has done, be not dismayed when men don't believe you. He'll understand. He will say, Well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You had been faithful of a few things. You had come to the end. He is able. He is willing to carry you through. Bishop Ellis was called and chosen to uplift and empower a people God desired to reveal himself to and prove to us that with him, nothing is impossible. God used the life of this servant, His Grace, Bishop Neil Clarence Ellis, to serve as an example that you too have been anointed to walk in victory.
You've always done things on your terms. I am so proud of you. I am not surprised at all, but I believe that the next chapter of your life, you will continue to change the world through the gifts God has given you. I love you and peace be with you and to your family. Those three words, I would say man of God. Man of God. Bishop Neil Ellis, my friend, my dear friend, I am so very proud of you. You have demonstrated what it is to be obedient to God and to walk in your purpose. Chicken, chips, burgers, ribs, so good, I'm getting better. A chicken unlimited, Ooh. unlimited. Ooh. I hope that the witness that he has given will bear fruit, fruit that will last. That's the hope that the God gives to all of us. All right, three words to describe Bishop Neil Ellis. Those three words would be down to earth. Uh, three words I describe my father as, or I, my dad as his greatest father ever. Three words. I'm sure there are going to be lots. Visionary, planner, family, love, all of the above. And this is how I'm cheating because I said a lot of words, but my final three words are going to be my big brother. Consistent, family, love. He, first of all, he's a visionary. He is incredible. Bishop is real, he is committed to the cause, he's a loving man, he's a wise man, he's a proverb man. Appointed, that God appointed him for an assignment and in a time such as this as we have seen in our country that we needed somebody like Bishop Ellis who remained steadfast in preaching God's unadulterated word to his people. And I commend him for it, and I believe his latter years will be far greater than the former. You want to take your time to say congratulations. You've done an excellent job. On behalf of the descendants, spiritual and biological, of the late Reverend Dr. Earl Manford Wallstone Francis, I know my father is deeply, deeply proud of the impact of your influence of your witness and of your testimony. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for loving him. Thank you for never forgetting him. And thank you for blazing a trail in this country. You're my bishop. I love you for 39, 40 years plus. I always love you. I enjoy your time here in ministry. Every Sunday was challenging, but I took it on. Serving the Lord will pay off. So be encouraged and God bless you. God bless you, sir. May heaven face shine upon you and give you his peace at night. Someone me and Joel and Edmund and all will join in with you and just play some good dominoes. <laughs> and we wish Bishop Ellis the best for his big heart and for his anointed ministry that has impacted so many millions around the world. God bless you, sir. May the Lord continue to bless you in all that you do going forward. We love you. Bishop, I, I just want you to know that I love you. I thank you. I, I've been through some challenges in my life, and I am just grateful that you allow me to be a part of this work that God gave you to do. I wish for you, First Lady and the family, health and abundance more than you could ever imagine. Peace of mind, prosperity, happiness, joy, and lots of love and laughter. And I believe as a brother, uh, I can be proud uh, to be an Ellis simply because of the legacy, uh, the spirit of excellence, the order, the structure, and the anointing uh, that is on your life.
I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Hey! Was all 